Thanks, Fritzy and Chloe and the whole team at our alumni, our wonderful alumni association. Look, it's a, it's really is an honor for me to be here. I'm here with the person I work most closely with, Laura Hasner. You may see her, her. She's, she's got dancing bears and all kinds of things. Uh, she's, anyways. Laura and I work very closely on this uh, change maker project and initiative, and so the, the topic here is framed with that, that initiative and I'll be talking about culture. Actually, um, not that this is so relevant, but when I get a chance to teach executives, when, when senior people come to Berkeley's business school and I teach a session, this is pretty much what I teach them. So I'm gonna give you some stuff that um, you may not have thought so much about, but at the end of the day, this idea of change makers as culture setters, um, that might not sound like it's an obvious topic but but how do you how does one set culture i mean we think of national culture or you know ethnic culture there's so many ways to think about culture uh, but we don't i think at, at early on in our lives think about organizational culture right or even team right i've got a project team we've got a paper due in a month what is the culture of this team and so i want to get you thinking a little bit about things that are that are very relevant to your to your everyday. So that's that's the basic frame. But let me let me jump out of that topic of, of setting culture and just talk briefly about change maker, Berkeley change maker. Those two words together uh, fit like hand and glove, given Berkeley's history and what Berkeley represents. Right, and this this. Uh, I like to use the word agency, this sense of, look, we do want to have an impact on the world. We want our lives to have impact and we want to make sure that we're leaving the university with the skills that we need to be able to do that and the mindset. And that's part of what this Berkeley Changemaker effort uh, is about. It's, it's partly a curriculum, but it's also a narrative. It's, you, you could say, well, that's like an identity for this campus. And, and I think a lot of people would agree with you that it is uh, codifying something that has always been about, but we haven't always been using that phrase, Berkeley Changemaker. And so there was a course that we launched uh, this last summer that some of you may have seen uh, advertised. Some of you may have been in it. It was focused mostly on incoming students, incoming freshmen in particular, although transfers, uh, we certainly want to cover the, the transfer population as well. So the course was called the Berkeley Changemaker. That was that was the name of the course. And at the end of the day, we we'd known from some pilot courses. There was a course taught in the business school to it was open to all undergraduates, seventeen different uh, majors, by a faculty member by the name of Alex Budak. And Alex taught a course uh, some two three years ago for the first time called Becoming a Changemaker. And as I said, it, it was for a lot, there were 17 different majors out of about 50 in the class. The class did just, just phenomenally well, right? So it was striking an important chord. And so this course that we developed, uh, Alex and Laura and lots of other faculty helped develop a course this summer that we taught, the summer just passed, called the Berkeley Changemaker. So over 500 incoming students signed up for that class. And, uh, you know, this idea that, well, what if, what if we had a course called Berkeley Changemaker colon quantitative reasoning? What if you could knock off your quantitative reasoning requirement on a why, what I'll call a why platform, right? A platform that provides purpose and why, no less rigorous, but it's like aim the tool at this stuff because that's what I'm interested in is having an impact in my life. Um, you could also imagine a course called Berkeley Changemaker colon American Cultures. There are many, and there need to be many different ways for you to fulfill an American culture's requirement, but we'd also like one of those to be on this platform called Berkeley Changemaker. So these are some of the things that are, that are evolving, and, and that's, that's the frame. So this, this idea of setting a winning culture, uh, it's one of the ways that we think about it. what's in the Changemaker toolkit. Come on, let's get concrete. What am I going to do differently? Uh, this is one of the things that's in the change maker toolkit. It's just one of many, many things, but I'll, I'll kind of go deep on this one because it's, excuse me, almost surely one that you haven't thought very much about or what I'll say when I was your age and a Berkeley undergrad, I, I certainly hadn't thought very much about it. I hadn't, well, I'll tell you a few stories, but much later in my life, I hadn't thought very much about it and, and I needed to, and, and I'll, I'll share that with you, uh, in just a moment. Um, before I do, just one last comment on the Berkeley Changemaker. So, um, you know, many of you are, are uh, 
well into your studies at Berkeley, obviously, and and beyond. Um, I want to read to you. So I mentioned that the Berkeley Changemaker, that course that attracted over 500 uh, students this summer, was aimed at incoming, uh, mostly freshmen. There was one senior that snuck in. I have no idea how uh, he or she snuck in, but but we did have a senior in there. But this, you know, in the in the evaluations, and this person said it's okay for I won't give the name, but um, I'm just going to read a little bit what a senior said after having taken the Berkeley Changemaker class this summer. Now I'll, I'll read it real quickly. Another great reason as to why anyone, regardless of grade should take this class is because you can definitely practice what you have learned on campus, but most importantly, outside of campus. Especially after graduating, when students start to search for a job and participate in interviews, or work in a job where you are given a team leadership position, or become an assistant or head assistant in a research lab, or even within your own friend or colleague groups, you can show your communication skills and be able to handle certain situations when a leader is called for. I know many friends and peers who could be amazing leaders, but they do not know how to have the courage and confidence to speak up and organize a situation swiftly and effectively. This course gives the basics of how you do so. And as opportunities arise to practice those skills, those experiences would hone the basic foundational skills we have learned in the class to slowly make us into the leaders we aspire to be. So that wasn't, you know, that was an unsolicited uh, perspective from the only, happened to be the only senior in the class. But this idea that this, this skill set is relevant really throughout not just your time at Berkeley, but, but also your life beyond. So if you want to know more about the Berkeley Changemaker, go to the website uh, changemaker.berkeley.edu, changemaker.berkeley.edu. Somebody can put that in the chat. There's a lot more information about various courses, a copy of the syllabus if you want to see what's taught and so forth. So I'm going to change gears. I want to make sure that we have time for, for chat. I think we did uh, discussion Q&A. I did pass out a case. So that's the kind of case that gets taught in business schools. I know most of you are not business majors. You, you need not be interested in business, but, but the idea is no matter what you want to do in life, I mean, if you want to organize an, a, an NGO, a non-governmental organization, or you want to, whatever you want to do, sort of this skill set we think will, will be valuable for you. And, um, and this, the course is, is being taught this spring. There's another offering of the Berkeley Changemaker this spring, if, if you're interested. Now, this topic, culture. Let me start this way. When, so I, I became acting dean. For one year, I was acting dean. I then became the dean of the high school. But I became acting dean, um, well, it was about 15 years ago now. And I'm, I was well into my career. Um, and one of the Haas board members, so these are the advisory board members. This would be true with the chemistry board or the LNS board or any part of the campus. Um, these are people that have run companies, they've run organizations, they've run things that, that matter with lots of people in them. And one of them said, I still remember who it was, I won't mention the name, but, but this person said, leaders, they were, this is at a board meeting, right? And I'm like this new interim dean, because the dean uh, had been tapped by the then Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger to be the director of finance. Tom Campbell was the dean at the time. And now all of a sudden, you talk about imposter syndrome. It's like, all of a sudden, bang, you're the interim dean. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, let's see what happens here. Okay. And I'm in a board meeting with all these current and former CEOs. Um, and one of them says to me, Leaders set culture pretty, pretty firmly, kind of like that. And, um, you know, 15 years ago, again, I'm well into my career at that point. Uh, I didn't really know what that meant. Uh, what, do you, what do we mean by culture? What, how do you set culture? What are the levers? How do you do this? I mean, this is not something I've ever thought of. I'm an economist, okay? So my, you know, as an academic, I've been a faculty member most of my life. And 
I do economics and and culture, you know, economists think about incentives, like what's the compensation for doing that? Who owns the decision right for that? What's the structural relationship between this person and that person, right? That's the way economists think. Uh, behavioral norms and values, culture, that kind of stuff, not typically the domain of economics. All right, why am I telling you this? Because that was one of the most valuable pieces of advice that I've ever received. I didn't fully understand it, but it was valuable. So here's like, I'm gonna mention like three or four takeaways in this session. And it's like, if you forget nothing else, or if you write nothing else down, or you don't care about anything else I say, these things I think will be valuable for you. And here's number one. It's not just that leaders set culture. If you wanna remember that, please do. But here's, it. ask somebody, you're, you're at a, an event, you know, probably digitally, but, but imagine being in person with, with some people. Here's a fun question to ask somebody. What's the best advice you've ever received? Or, or if not best, you know, something that's like in your top five or top 10. That is a great conversation starter. And what you will get is a story, usually personal, usually full of wisdom. This is one of my, if somebody asked me that question, this is one of the things that I say. It's sort of like, I, I didn't really know what the advice was about. And since then, I've kind of become obsessed, just being honest with you, with, with this question of how leaders set culture or how, how change makers uh, become cult culture setters. All right. So I'm going to talk about, I've got basically the remainder of my comments are in three chunks. Number one, I want to talk about some cases. So again, you don't have to have any interest in business school, but one of the ways that business schools teach is they, uh, we, we offer situations in real life. And then it's like, well, what lessons can we, can we grab from those situations? So I'll, I'll mention two super quick cases. That's, that's one topic. The seven to second topic, I want to talk about lessons, kind of some of the lessons that I took away from those cases in my own experiences. And then the third is sort of you. It's like, why is this relevant to me? I am not the dean of a school or the CEO of a company and don't aspire to be. So why is this relevant to me? I want to talk about how, how you can put some of this stuff into practice. Because again, when I was your age, if somebody said, be a leader, set culture, be like, I have no idea what you're talking about, like zero. Um, so that's, that's what I want to try and do is square that, square that circle. All right. Topic number one, these two cases. Now, let me give you an example of so, so I'm an economist. I don't, let me define culture, all right? So by culture, I'm using the term to refer to be behavioral norms and values. So think of shared behaviors, behavioral norms, and the values that connect to them, right? Um, often our behaviors are a reflection of the underlying values. So you can see, think of your values as the deep part. But a lot of people, when they talk about culture the way it manifests in a school or in a department or in a company or on a team or whatever. Uh, ultimately, they're talking about behaviors. Wow, these people behave this way. And these be people, uh, you know, this is baseball team A, this is baseball team B, and these people behave totally differently. It's like, how does that happen? They're, they're baseball or whatever it is, right? And so how do we understand how those behavioral norms and values evolve? That's really what, what culture is about. So think behaviors. That's kind of a core idea here. What are the behaviors that, that look similar within this group and don't look so similar in other groups and, and why? All right. So I left Berkeley to go on leave. I was on leave for about two years. Um, and mentioned that I was the chief learning officer. I was, I was overseeing what's called uh, Goldman Sachs University. So I went to a bank. I'd never worked in a bank. Um, and I was doing leadership development, learning and development, right? And, and so one of the things that I got to work on while I was there, so, so the culture at Goldman Sachs or any bank, but especially Goldman Sachs, it's totally different than the culture at, at UC Berkeley, for example. It's obviously, you know, a totally different environment. Um, it's very intense. So one of the things that I realized is that the people in it, so I, because I was doing learning and development, I was in a part of the company, Goldman Sachs, called HR, human resources. They actually call it human capital management, but it's sort of like the people management part of the company. And what that also meant is that I was on 
in a group because of my role called the operating committee of the company's people management, the operating committee of HCM. That meant I got to see like inside the engine room of how they did HR. How do they, of course, how do they train their people? That's, that was my job. But also things like how do they set culture within the company? What does intentionality about culture look like? So you talk about the moment when the scales fell from my eyes. I'm actually in this bank watching them be intentional about culture. It's like, what's the first experience somebody has with Goldman Sachs? And it's sort of like, no, we're not talking about day one of employment. We're talking about the first interview. The, the whole process is sort of like, how do we make sure people understand what our culture is about? Uh, the culture of Goldman Sachs is very much like a partnership culture. It's sort of like, are you in or aren't you in? Are you on the team or not on the team? If you are on the team, it's sort of like, it's a big deal. You know, some people describe Goldman, even relative to other banks, as cultish. It's so intense. And again, you don't have to like or just, it's not about, it's not a, a, a judgment about the, the content of the culture. This is about the intentionality of how do you create a strong culture? All right. One of the other things that I got to work on at Goldman, and then I'll move to the second case, is, and this was incredibly interesting to me. Now, again, I'm not a sociologist. I'm, I'm, there, there are lots of things that I have never done before. Um, I got to work on a project while I was at Goldman Sachs called the Top 5 Culture Shocks Experienced by Outside Higher Senior People. So in the, in the banking industry, a managing director is like top 5% of your people. So it's quite senior people. So when you hire a managing director from some other company and they come in and it's sort of like, yeah, but they came in from JP Morgan. It's just another bank, right? It's sort of like, no. People who've been in the industry for 25, 30 years, they come into Goldman Sachs thinking they know what the culture is about and they come in and it's like, oh my gosh, this is totally different. Now, what we did is what we in the social sciences call ethnographic research. We actually sat these people down and talked to them and watched them and listened to them. It's like, what's hard about the culture? What's different? Tell us a story, tell us these stories. And we, we listened to and gathered these stories. Um, I'll just give you one example of one of these top culture shocks. But again, people, people were saying, I mean, here, here's an example. When, when you sit down and have lunch with two or three people that are like three months in from some other bank, so long enough to like see things, but not long enough to acculturate, not long enough to fit yet. And so they're like at the height of this, oh my gosh, what's going on here? This is so different. And you know, one of them might say, I still remember this, one of them would say to you as you're talking to them at lunch, so wait, wait a minute, look, now I'm pretending I'm this person talking to me, right? This person might say, oh, I, I'm getting all these voicemails. I'm getting all these emails. Once a week, a peer, another managing director slaps my wrist, slaps my wrist and says, Rich, I should have known that. And you should have told me that. Now, so th this is an information sharing norm. It's sort of like, what does it mean to have a part partnership culture? Yeah, we're all on the same team. It's sort of like, no, you share information. Now, it is human nature to hoard information. When you're in a company or you're, it's sort of like, yeah, I would be, but no, most people, it's like that information is valuable. I'm going to keep it for me. It's going to be valuable to me. Why would I spread it around? It's really good information about what a client might do or whatever it is, right? And the idea is, no, when we play on the same team, we do what's best for the team. And very often that means sharing information that's valuable for the team. Now, most companies, all of you have had, most all of you have had some work experience. Most companies do not have an information sharing norm. Most companies have what I would call, in the economics jargon, a hoarding norm. It's like, why would I share this information? I'm just going to keep it to myself. That's what describes how people behave. And in Goldman Sachs, people don't do that. Now, Goldman Sachs doesn't get this exactly right. But, but is this a really strong norm? And do they 
intentionally manage this norm, they actually do. It's like, this is what playing on the same team looks like. And I'm overstating it a little bit, but you can imagine, you know, the fourth time somebody slaps your wrist, they say, hey, Rich, this really isn't working, is it? And then people leave and nobody benefits when you've done all you need to do to hire a really senior person and they come in and then they leave six months later because they couldn't acculturate. It's like, oh, not good for anybody. Now, one final comment on this Goldman Sachs thing. For, well, actually, two more, if I may. One, here's one. So I'm an economist and I do international finance, as, as I mentioned. This is point number one. In banking, there is a big deal called inside information. And like, I don't know if you know what investment banking is, but, but like if there's going to be a merger or an acquisition, and that's not public information, but the people who are managing the merger within the investment banking group at Goldman Sachs, if they let the trading room know that information, that's illegal. It's totally illegal. In fact, regulators sit on the trading floor and they watch to see if that's happening. So that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about doing anything illegal. This is all about, look, if information can flow, does it? Is there a behavioral norm that gets it to flow? Now, Here's the example, and then I'll go to the second case. This is the second of the two things that I wanted to say. Here's how I shock people. So when I teach executives, I usually say exactly this. I say, thought experiment. There are two universes, universe A and universe B. Universe A is the universe we live in. Goldman Sachs has this behavioral norm. Almost no other companies in their industry or in the economy do. There's this, this, they call it their posting norm, but this, this, this sharing of information norm. They don't get it exactly right, but it's intense. Universe B is exactly the same as universe A. The only difference is we're gonna take away this one behavioral norm. So Goldman Sachs is the same in universe B as it is in universe A. It just doesn't have this one behavioral norm. And then I pose the question in this thought experiment. Is it possible that Goldman Sachs A is worth 5% more than Goldman Sachs B, or 3%, or 7%, or 10%, whatever the number. We're talking percentages of enterprise value, percentages of company value coming from a single behavioral norm. And when I say this to senior people, nobody takes issue with it. Nobody says, no, 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 a behavioral norm like that couldn't account for 3 or 5 or 7% of enterprise value. Nobody says it. So that's part of, you know, this idea that, look, if we can get better at a single behavior, we can add percentages to the value of what we're trying to do. And again, don't just think, yeah, if that's a bank, I, you know, you might not care one whit about banking. That's fine. What if we could do the same thing for your church? What if we could think, do the same thing for your nonprofit organization? What if we could do the same thing for your department at Berkeley? One behavioral norm change. Make it 5% better at what it's supposed to be doing. Ah, okay, maybe. So uh, don't think of this as just a super narrow example. All right, so that's this Goldman Sachs. Again, I arrive at sort of like, what is going on here? What does intent, so that was my big aha. What does intentionality around culture setting look like? Nobody had ever now, I had already been acting dean. I had already heard that advice, leaders set culture. So I had started reading and thinking about culture. And then I got to see what it looks like in the engine room of intentionality. And it's like, oh my gosh. Now, example two, I'm still in my first category of three categories. The other two categories will go faster. I wanna make sure you have time to ask me questions. But I was at Goldman Sachs less than about two years, a little bit less than that. And I got an offer to come back to Berkeley to be dean of the high school. That was the honor of my life. There was no question that I wanted to do that. I did do that. I came back. And so I'm sitting at my computer screen. It's July 2008. That happens to be the year that I started as dean. And I go on the high school's website and I search for culture, core values, principles. What do I find? Nothing, nothing's been written down. Nothing's been codified. 
Now, if you ask yourself, does Berkeley as a university or the Haas School in 2008, did it have a culture? Of course it does. Again, culture, behavioral norms. Are there behavioral norms and values that we share? Of course. I mean, if you say, does Berkeley have a way of behaving? Does it have a set of values that most all of us subscribe to? Is that part of why we, were, we are here rather than going to some other school? In fact, values is, is that deep attractor that most gives most of us a sense of purpose, a sense of affiliation and belonging. So, so Haas had a culture, but it had never been codified. So if in 2008 you say, hey, come to Haas because, you know, we got these great values. We got this great, you know, it's just people behave the right way. It's like, well, what does that mean? It's un, un, unexplicit. So you saw from that case, if you had a chance to look at it, we did pass it around. Um, there were four, I'm not going to go through a lot of detail here, but there were four principles that we wrote down. We called them defining principles. And then as, as time went on, we started to refer to them as defining leadership principles. Because we would challenge people. Do you know any leaders you respect that are really effective that don't align with these four behaviors, with these four ways of being, um, these four principles? And, and so we started to, to use the word leadership. These are, this is a way of thinking about leading. Um, the four, real quickly, as you saw from the case, if you read it, question the status quo. So let me just stop on that one. Question the status quo. That's right. Nobody was surprised, right? This is Berkeley. Nobody said, question the status quo. Where did you, where did you get that? That's just incredibly creative. It's just sort of like, it's been around here forever. That's Berkeley. Now, you might say, and this is one of the risks when you, when you set culture. Again, change makers is culture setters. There are a lot of words you could choose that would be unobjectionable. I mean, let me use the word excellence. I don't mean to take away from the word excellence, but... Everybody says excellence. Question the status quo. So, thought experiment. The president of Harvard University, very creative, obviously great university, comes out tomorrow and says, Harvard University, we're all about questioning the status quo. Dissonance would not work. Not to take away from Harvard's greatness. It's a great institution, but that's not where they come from. That's not their identity. That's not what they stake themselves on. So this is not just one of these things. Oh yeah, Princeton could say that. Harvard could say that, etc. It's sort of like, no, Berkeley like owns this. And it's part of why we are who we are. All right. The other three more quickly. Um, question the status quo, confidence without attitude. Confidence without attitude. Students always, right? A sense that I know even at the end of my life, I'm not fully baked. I have more to learn. I still have feedback to hear. People forget that as they move through their lives. Just as an, This isn't just curiosity. It goes beyond that. And the last one, by no means least, beyond yourself. We use the phrase beyond yourself, a sense of stewardship for something larger. Maybe some of you have heard the phrase, officers eat last. So that, that's, a, that's a style of leadership, a way of being. And of course, it's something you could say, are there, aren't there beyond yourself people at, at Stanford? Of course there are. But Berkeley is a public university. Stanford and Harvard and Princeton, they're all private universities. It doesn't mean there aren't beyond yourself, but, but service to something larger is in Berkeley's DNA. 70% of the faculty that are at Berkeley, in my, my conjecture, wouldn't be at Berkeley if it weren't public. That Berkeley is public means something. It means something to our faculty. It means something to our staff. It means something to our alumni. All right. So those are the four things that we wrote down. And then you saw in the case, one of the things that I'm going to show you, I'm going to share the screen here uh, real quickly. I can find, there it is. Um, and let me go to, um, to full screen mode here. So this was in the case. It is um, page seven there, exhibit one. 
So real quickly, if somebody said, yeah, 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 yeah. So you wrote these things down. God, you could have written anything down. It's like, yeah, I, I belong to this company over here. We got four. We got a card. When I joined the company, they gave me a card. The card had the four principles or whatever, five principles, three. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on. This doesn't really matter, does it? Well, when people say, show me the data, show me that it matters. Now, these data, again, they're in the case that you got. We ask students, this happens to be the MBA program, the uh, full-time MBA program. We ask them, all right, you only get one reason. If you had to pick one reason why you chose Haas over other schools, and just so you understand, the full-time MBA competition is worldwide and top students usually get into two or three or four really good schools, okay? So you got into Chicago, you got into Wharton, you got into Columbia, you got into Berkeley, whatever. You, you got like two or three or four choices. It's not like, oh, I only, I'm an undergrad, I mean, it's like, okay, I applied to these two places, I really wanted that place or three places or four, whatever. But in, in the MBA world, it tends to be, you're applying to lots of really good schools, you get into a few if you're a top student. All right, what are the reasons you chose? Now, the numbers we, I, we can go by at the, I'm not gonna look at the orange numbers. We, we can if you're interested, but um, the blue numbers. So what are some of the biggest things? Well, location there, you see, location is way up there. I wanted to get my MBA in Silicon Valley. I wanted to be in this geography to get my MBA. All right, perfectly sensible. The, the, the second longest blue line there is brand reputation, right? The school has got a great reputation. Um, that's, I just chose it because it had a bigger reputation than any other school I got into, for example. But culture defining principles, three times as many sites as anything else. Again, we're saying one factor that caused you to choose Berkeley. So this is talent that we want. We admitted them. Why did they come? And they said, it hit me right here, right? That, that's, some people were saying that's the leader I aspire to be. Those are the qualities I want to participate in. That's what I respect. Those are the leaders I look up to. Now, is this the only way to lead? Absolutely not. If somebody said, I've seen a lot of very successful leaders who are not well described by confidence without attitude, by the way, true, not true, absolutely true. So part of what taking a stand on culture or values is about, it's sort of like, what are you about? Take a stand that does not describe everybody else. Make it different. That was also in the case. And then live by it. So final comment on this, on this case, this Haas case. If you say, yeah, but how do you, how do you kind of let people know you're serious? So when I was Dean and students got into Haas and they got into other schools, they would very often come, we call it days at Haas, they would often come to the business school to make their final decision. It's like, oh, I'm deciding between Chicago and Wharton and Haas and you know, I'm gonna come to your, your cell weekend, your days at, days at Haas weekend. So I'm standing in front of them, the current dean does something similar. And, and I say that, now they've been through the admissions process. The admissions process is shot through with this stuff. We ask letter writers, for example, to comment on whether you are well described by confidence without attitude. Give us examples. That's an interesting question to ask a letter writer. Now, you're in front of the students. They have a week to decide. You've admitted them. They're in two or three other schools. Here's something I, was, I would say to them, or I did say to them. You're meeting people in this room, people that we hope will be your roommates, or your classmates rather. Many of them have, have already decided. If you're meeting somebody and thinking, wow, she's absolutely terrific, but how did she get through the confidence without attitude interview? And then they chuckle. I say two things. One, I'd like to hear about it. Let me know. Simple enough. Two, you might not want to come here. Because it means I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth. Because it means we look at, at applications and think, ah, oh, but this is a big donor. Yeah, terribly described by confidence without attitude. But this person or this person's family is a big donor. Or they're a legacy. Uh, it's, you know, we got to take them, right? Let's just swallow. Sort of like, look, if you're going to 
have a principle and you're going to define an institution using it, you got to live by it or people will tear you to pieces. So this notion of writing it down is one thing. Living by it is quite another. And part of the reason so many students say, I chose it because of this, was not because they saw four words on a, on a card or four words, four phrases in an, in an application. It's because when they met the students and they met the faculty and they met employers who know us this way, they said, it's real. It's actually real. So one of you, if you read the case, you saw one of the goals of the Haas School was to make this business school the most defined by culture, hyphens, defined by culture business school. And that was one of the goals. All right. So those are two cases. I go into Goldman Sachs, the scales fall down from my eyes. Holy smokes, what does intentionality look like? I get to Berkeley, tabula rasa. Yes, a culture, a wonderful culture, but never codified, never driven into admissions, never used as the asset that it actually is. Final comment. Again, I, I, usually, I usually say this in, in my executive education session, so I'll say it to you, but it's a way to communicate to people why this matters. And here's what I say. We just opened a new building, Chu Hall. Just, it was a few years ago now, right? Kevin Chu, this wonderful gift among other people, made that building possible. How much did that building cost? If, if you've seen Chu Hall on campus, just, it's, it's part of the Haas School there. $80 million, all in, roughly, maybe 70. That's a tangible asset. It's gonna be here for a long time. And then I pose this question as the thought experiment. How many students do you think choose Haas because of Chu Hall? Some, right? They come visit, they see, wow, brand new facilities, new building, bodes well for the financial sustainability of the school, good energy. I'm not saying no, none of them do, but you could probably count them on two hands. And then you ask the question, how many students are choosing Haas because of the culture? You saw the data, it's right in front of you. So I'm gonna take that down, I'm gonna stop the share. But so, so I conclude this comment with, the building is an $80 million tangible asset. The culture is an intangible asset. Arguably, the culture is a larger asset. And I think people start to realize Huh, hadn't really thought about it that way. So this is a domain, again, when I was, not when I was just your age, when I was 45, when I was acting dean, none of this was really on my radar screen. And now, as I said, I'm kind of obsessed with it. All right, category two and category three, and then I'll open it up for comments. It's 619 already. We don't have that much more time. I think we have till 645. So I'm just gonna go more quickly through the next two. I really did want to spend extra time on those stories. But the next two topics, first of all, what are some of the lessons for me, right? And then finally, what are some of the lessons for you? What are some of the things that I think could be useful for you, like tomorrow, okay? Sorry, I'm not the dean of the business school, so what, do I'm, what am I doing tomorrow? All right, lessons. Here's number one. I said it before, but I, I will say it again. It's sort of like leaders set culture. I mean, it's it's part of the toolkit. And here's, when I was visiting, I remember, I first heard this at, at Intel, but there, I, there are a number of companies that speak this way. When I was, when I was Dean, I visited Intel. They, had a, they have a phrase at Intel. They say, lead from where you are. Lead from where you are. So you're just out of undergrad, you get a job at Intel, to use the example. You come in, it's sort of like, we need you to show leadership. It's like, what are you talking about? I'm an analyst, I just, I just got here. I, what, it's, no, we need you to exhibit, to practice leadership. It's like, well, what does that look like? I just arrived. Now we'll talk a little bit more about that, but there's also this concept of not just lead from where you are, but lead culture from where you are. Oh, no, 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 come on, lead culture. Deans, CEOs, they lead culture, sort of like, no. How do you think about, for example, the behavioral norms and values that are governing 
the project team that you're on right now that are governing if you happen to serve in the ASUC Senate? How does, what are the behavioral norms and values of the Senate? What are the behavioral norms and values? Oh, this is a scary one. I don't mean to scare you. What are the behavioral norms and values of your family at the dinner table? So we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit more about leading culture from where you are, but you're early in your life. But that doesn't mean the levers of culture can't still be worked. I'll talk more about that. Leaders set culture. It's fundamental to leadership. That's point one, okay? That's take sort of lesson number one. Lesson number two, behaviors. Lesson number two is behaviors. We're talking about the way people behave. So you might say, ah, oh, it's all this abstract stuff about values and principles. It's sort of like, you know, at the end of the day, we're really looking for how people behave and how do they behave differently. And that's an important, that's an important element of this. I think it's, it's easy to kind of forget the link between culture and behavior, but behavior is really the way practitioners think about culture. So for example, if you, if you say, all right, the business school is, or, or letters and science or, or a company or a nonprofit organization in any collection of people that are doing things together, they have a set of processes that they operate by. It's like, how do we hire people? How do we do performance evaluation? How do we talk to clients? What letter do I send you when we hire you? So I'm just gonna give you a small example. When we admit somebody to Haas in 2008, they get a letter. What does it say? Congratulations and some other stuff. Does it mention culture? Not at all, not in 2008. But now you start to realize, wait a minute, we want somebody to, to understand that part of why we chose them was their fit with the culture and their respect for these principles. And that's one of the things, so, so when we think about the behaviors, it's like, well, think about people that you know and appreciate, right? I mean, what if you were writing a letter of recommendation for a business school and that business school said, I really want your honest view on whether this person's behavior conforms well to confidence without attitude. There are a lot of people that are really good that aren't well described by that phrase. So, you know, you're looking for those behaviors and you want to select for them. Now, one of the dangers of strong culture is monoculture, right? Group think, it's sort of like the cult problem. It's like, wait a minute, you're sounding so intense. I mean, at what point does this go too far? Well, part of why we put question the status quo at the top of the stack, usually when we talk about them, we put question the status quo, is to prevent the kind of ossification, the kind of groupthink that can happen when cultures become too strong, too narrow. But anyways, behaviors, key. So number one lesson for me, is this leader set culture. It's part of the leadership toolkit. Number two, think behaviors. Number three, last one of this list is think goals. So think behaviors is number two, goals. Think goals. What is the goal of your project team? What is the goal of your work group? What is the goal of your club? What is the goal of any group of people that you're part of? And who owns the culture? I think when, when, when you open your eyesight to culture and you start to realize, actually, you know, when people go into critical thinking mode, somebody comes up with an idea. I'm sitting in this team meeting or whatever. Somebody comes up with an idea and then somebody, this person or, or all of us, we tend to like jump on it. It's like, yeah, but come on, but, 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 but right? And so very often when people wanna be more innovative, it's sort of like, no, let's get the ideas on the table. So we're going to go into an ideation phase. We don't have to use sticky notes. We can do it however we want, but we want to get people's creativity. We don't want somebody to say, hey, here's an idea, and then they get slammed down. It's sort of like, that's going to prevent creativity. 
we need to make room for creativity and then we can collectively put on our critical thinking hats and evaluate whether any one of them or a collection of them makes sense. But don't do the critical thinking. All right, so this is an example where somebody could say, hey, let's actually get the ideas out first before we kind of go after them because we might see connections between them. We might, right, if we do it sequentially and knock them down. All right, it, a simple idea as that can totally change the outcomes of whether a group or a team reaches a creative outcome. And that's proven. There's lots of research on this. That's just one example. So what is the goal? Are we trying to produce a better paper? Are we trying to change people's behavior? Are we trying to get a referendum on the ballot? Or whatever we're trying to do. Now for a company, it's sort of like, what are the goals of the company, right? And so a Goldman Sachs, for example, this sharing information norm, it's sort of like we can serve, this is their view, we can serve clients better if we're sharing information and we understand what client needs are and so forth. But the important point is you want the culture to be strategically relevant. You want the culture to be designed, the behaviors that make up the culture to be designed to achieve certain goals. And that's part of, so, so what was the high school's culture designed for, for example? Well, you could say, well, first of all, there were a lot of business schools that were never going to say, we are about questioning the status quo. Harvard's not gonna say that. Wharton's not gonna say that. Stanford GSB isn't gonna say that. These are tough, great competitors. There are a lot, so part of it was we want to separate ourselves competitively, but on something we care about. So we want to be different. And we want people to that, that feel that this is a home for them to come. It's a talent magnet. It's a, it's a, it's a people vision. It's like, this is what we think the future of leadership needs more of. And if you don't like it, fine. Go to a, we don't say it this way because it sounds like it's got a lot of attitude to it. But, but the idea is, you know, there are a lot of great business schools. This is who we are. Please choose us if it sounds right. But, but you're also inviting people to self-select to another school. And if somebody says, why you're limiting our applicant pool. Some people are going to hear something they don't like to hear. It's like, take a stand, please. You're too important an institution in a sea of like institutions to not take a stand, to not have something that you stand for, that people say, I like that, and I'm not hearing that or that combination anywhere else. It's like that makes people want to work here, makes people want to be here. And again, it's not for everybody, but for the people it is for, boom, feels like it's got some purpose in it. Okay. Last comment is um, sort of you. And I've hinted at this, and we have still 15 minutes for discussion. How many project teams have you been on, right? You've got a group project you got to do or in your work or summer internship or whatever. You're constantly doing work with three, four, five, six other people. How many times have you thought about the de facto shared behavioral norms that have arisen? Often they arise organically, right? You got to get the work done. But it's like, yeah, she always says this then, he always does that, we always, but nobody's actually discussing it. So for example, imagine we're a project team and I said to you, not, look, I'm the leader, I'm gonna set the culture, right? That ain't gonna work very well. But if instead you said, hey, could we spend just five minutes thinking about what, what things, what actions we could take, what things each of us could do that would make us better as a team? For example, leaving a little bit more room for creative ideas when they're first when they're first offered, or you know, the, providing feedback one on one rather than in front of everybody. Right? It's like we should provide feedback to one another. We're going to be better. But you just like hammered me in front of the whole group. Why just take me aside? I promise I'll listen. But then you say that, and I feel defensive, and the whole thing goes to a bad place. Okay, so, you know, let's, these are things that can get discussed in advance. Every team you're on, it's sort of like, all right. In fact, 
this, so this is a little bit more business school jargon, I apologize. But in business school, you actually learn that there are these four phases of forming a team, forming a group, however small, that wants to get something done together. And they talk about forming, storming, sort of like it's hard to figure out what rules we're going to play by. Norming, creating common norms, common behaviors, and performing. Forming, storming, norming, performing. And, you know, it's sort of like, oh, well, those things happen naturally, right? Sort of like, no, actually, with some intentionality, the storming period can be a lot shorter because somebody's thinking through, how do we get to behavioral norms that are going to work from us, for us, okay? And somebody just mentioned they use that in ROTC. So I think there are lots of institutions that, that have thought through this. And some of you have had those experiences. So thank you for that chat. In fact, I've, I've, it looks like there are a lot of chats and I haven't been reading the chat. But that one popped up and I appreciate that example. So, so, so every team you've been on, a club, right? You're forming a club or you are becoming a leader in a club. It's like, will you shift its culture? I'll, I'll speak for myself. When I was your age, that question never came to mind. You know, and so when you start thinking about what, how, what are the level, levers of changing culture? Well, part of it is what are the what are the conversations that you're willing to introduce to the group? What are the questions you're willing to ask? You don't want to impose authority when you don't have any formal authority, but you can cause conversations to happen that wouldn't otherwise have happened. Also providing feedback for people that are sort of not doing what the group needs to have done right now. How do you provide effective feedback? Sort of how do you, you know, punishes the wrong word, but how do you let somebody know, hey, that's not okay. Sorry, that's not, that's not getting us closer to our goal. It's really easy to not give feedback. And in fact, on feedback front, I'll, I'll, I'll finish up now, but on the feedback front, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got on the feedback front came from an executive coach who's written some great books. His name's Marshall Goldsmith. He's written a book called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. You have a success formula that you continue to apply and apply and apply. And then somebody gives you a big job, a different job, something quite different, and you want to keep applying the same success formula. What got you here won't get you there. And you have to change that, that perspective. And, and anyways, that's a book that he's written. But, but the advice is, he says, there are only two good words, the only two words that you should use to respond to feedback. Thank you. Most of us, we get defensive, right? But, but it's sort of like, thank you, right? You don't have to take their advice, but say thank you. Because if, feed, if people feel like you are receptive to feedback, they will provide it and you will develop faster. And, and teams that know how to give each other feedback in, in, in effective ways, they, they perform at a higher level, they develop faster, and your whole life long, it's sort of like, thank you. Thank you. Now that's hard, but it's valuable. All right, so those are some of the things where it's sort of like the you part, right? It's like, I can have some, I can catalyze some of those conversations. I've never really thought about myself that way. I'm stopping, it's 6.34 already. Um, I'd love to, um, it looks like there are an awful lot of great chats, but um, I don't know, I can't see all the hands up. If somebody wants to put a hand up or if Ann or, or um, Fritzy, if there's somebody you want to call on, we could, we could do it that way. Yeah, I can happily uh, moderate. So students, please uh, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask questions for Rich. Or if you're uncomfortable with that, you can type in your question and I can read it out for him. Can I seed you with a question, Rich, while everyone's Please. typing their comments Thanks, and Laura. collecting their thoughts? Um, thank you for that. Um, now, we have a lot of students in the audience who are going to be interviewing for internships, for jobs and things like that. And at the end of the interview, they always ask that question I dreaded, which is, what questions do you have for me? Mm. Is there a question, <laughs> I see Salvador's reaction. Yep. Is there a question that you could help our students think about that would help them to screen for the kind of culture that they wanna be a part of? That's really a neat question and a valuable question. I think, you know, asking, you, you could just say, well, 
what's your culture? That's not a good question because it's kind of like not they're not quite sure what you mean by that necessarily. But I but I think if you, if you said something like, you know, I just want to make sure that I kind of get how this place operates. So when when you hire people like me over the last couple of years and they come in and they're they're getting to know the culture. What are some of the surprises? What are some of the things you've heard from people my age that um, that 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 really make your company distinctive? You know, these little behaviors. You don't even have to use the word culture. You could just say behaviors that sort of make your company distinctive. They're going to go over the moon if you ask them that. It's sort of like, are you kidding me? Somebody at your stage of life is asking that subtle a question I think in that way. So so I think it, that would be an absolutely great and then they will they will answer it. It's sort of like, yeah, I mean, we, we they'll probably talk about their competitors and some of the things that they try to do to, to make it. Or they may be honest and say, hey, here are a few bits of feedback that we realize we're part systematically part of our culture that we need to dial down. This is not working for our for our interns and, and we're working on that. So, um, yeah, th that that's a real because those kinds of questions when when they realize you're operating at a higher level, right? That your mental model is sort of at level two or level three. Those are the kinds of questions that, you know, those are those are winners. So so thanks for that. Uh, Rich, I'm going to unmute one of our students. He has right. a question. Okay. Hi, hi, Rich. Uh, first off, thanks for your uh, talk. It was very um, insightful. Thanks. Um, awesome. One of the questions that I had was because you talked about the process of codifying Haas's core values. Um, was there ever a time where you were thinking of having a fifth core value? And if so, like hypothetically, what would that fifth core value be? Yeah, wow. I, I really love this, this question. Um, and, and the truth is that when you go through a process like this, right? Now you got to get a lot of fingers. So this was not me walking out of my office saying, here they are. These are the four. I'm the dean. You guys aren't. Here's what we're doing, right? It's like that doesn't work anywhere, right? So this stuff was 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 surfaced, right? We had conversations with tons of people. We had lists and candidates, you know, three, four, five, seven, ten different candidates on these lists. What do you think? What's powerful? Well, that's kind of like this. So if you do this, you don't need that. And there's this kind of thing, right? You want them. I don't know if you've ever heard this, this phrase in consulting, but they call about it MISI. Is it MISI? So if you have a taxonomy, a set of elements, are they mutually exclusive? And CE, collectively exhaustive. Does it span the whole space and there's no overlaps? Is the way to think about it in a Venn diagram, right? Whole space covered, no overlap. And things are never quite that simple, but it, but it's a helpful way to think about kind of how much they overlap. Um, so one of the things I'm just going to be super honest with you, right? Because I, yes, there was a list and we were, we, we knew we didn't want too many on the list, right? If, if you have, if you have eight things on a list and some great companies do, I don't mean it's not operationable, operationalizable, but it's, it gets problematic. Um, I'm going to tell the story this way because it's pretty close to being exactly true. Um, I remember early on in this process, a faculty member that I respect a lot and I'm very close to, he said to me, I'm not going to let you, more or less he said it this way, I'm not going to let you or this school write down a set. Now we were calling them core values at the time. This is going to end up being important. I'm not going to let you write down the core values of this school without the word excellence on that list. And that's like, it's hard to argue that excellence isn't important for, for a Berkeley, right? It's like, if your standards aren't at that level, like, where are they? Um, so we changed the nomenclature. We started calling them defining principles. And if you look at the strategic plan that the faculty voted on, there's a paragraph that precedes these four defining principles. And the paragraph says, there are things that will always be at the core of who we are, like excellence, like diversity and inclusion, like a number of other things. It's sort of like those will always be part of us and must be. And the things that differentiate us, the things that define us are these four things. And people felt comfortable with that, right? Now, but 
you know that was a that was a sticky wicket, right? It's sort of like it, you know you're you're if if you write down four things, the things that aren't on that list, and so so thanks for asking the question though that that became that became pretty fundamental. My my own view, not again not to take away from excellence, but you know not to take away from the Oakland Raiders, uh, I'll call them the Oakland Raiders, but be it, commitment to excellence is is where the Oakland Raiders are as well as many other institutions, right? So it's sort of like if if we'd had five and the first one on the list was excellence, I think a lot of people would take a lot of the oxygen out of the room, right? I think I think that that's fair to say. Somebody asked, I see in the chat, what's the C in me see? So it's it's M E mutually exclusive and collectively collectively exhaustive. In other words, when you put them all together, they span the whole space. They fill the whole Venn diagram. So it's collectively uh, exhaustive. M E C E. Me see. Um, yeah, I didn't know that acronym. Yeah, I've never worked in consulting, but I remember somebody using that that I worked with uh, using that acronym. I thought, well, that's conceptually a neat thing, right? Because you're, it's sort of like here's the parts list. Does the parts list define the universe of parts, and is there overlap between these parts categories? It's uh, it's helpful. Uh, collectively exhaustive. Yeah. Oh, I guess somebody else already answered it. Sorry, I'm I'm getting redundant uh, here. Um, other other questions. We just have a, a couple more minutes. But um, uh, Rich, so yeah. there's another question from Min. Okay. What's the role of employees when the leader or the, or the organization is not setting the right culture? Hugely important question and a really difficult question, right? I think you know. I think there are people that feel like as a nation, right? You could talk about an organization, but a nation that isn't conforming to the way you think about proper values and so forth, right? So it's 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 that's a deep and giant question. I think part of the question that there, there are people who who work in human resources in other areas that that are responsible for the culture, and making sure that they're feedback mechanisms, right? Safe ways for one to communicate to people, if you're talking about a company, but um, then there are people whose roles are sort of to be that, that go-between. And, you know, part of, if, 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 if part of the way I think you'd have to make that case is, look, our goals are, this is the mission. These are the goals of the company, right? And the gap between our stated values and our behaviors is taking away from our ability to do what this company is trying to do. I think that's the right way to say it. If you instead said, these are my personal values, this company isn't operating, in, right? It's sort of like people might say, look, if, if what this company is about is not what you're about, that's kind of, you have to make a decision. But if you can say the company says it's trying to do this and the values are not allowing us to achieve that, we need to have this conversation. There isn't an HR person in the world that would say, ah, oh, that's, come on, that's not important. I, I, I don't need to, to communicate that. So, so I think it would be an in HR initially. Uh, and if, if it's framed as, come on, we can do better as a company doing what we're trying to do. But, uh, you know, that... That's a pretty simplistic answer to a really deep question. We all know that we are in organizations, in societies, in nations that can be like radically antithetical. I mean, if you just thought about the current leadership of this country, and then you read that list of those four defining principles, I'll just read them again. Confidence without attitude. Students always. Beyond yourself. Question the status quo. We could say that one applies arguably a little bit more, but it's like, you no, know, like contraindicated on three of those four dimensions. And of course, by most any measure, a very successful leader. So um, this is taking a stand on things that, that we think matter. And at the end of the day, I'll conclude with this. It's like, People are hungry for meaning and purpose, and they're hungry for the institutions that they're part of to take a stand in a way that communicates shared meaning and purpose. And culture is right at the center of how that happens. And so I think that's, that's really, that's, it, 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 it's not just another tool in the leader's tool bag. It's like why we're here. It is our connection to purpose. And so it makes it even 
even more important as an area that, that's worthy of your thought and, and continued development. Um, so somebody asked me that the, the four that we gave, I, real quickly, um, confidence without attitude, students always, beyond yourself, question the status quo. Those are the four. They're in that case that got distributed and they're, and they're discussed in much more detail. Thank you for this opportunity. I've overshot by, by a minute already, but um, you know you know where to find me. I'm on campus. Um, I'm working closely with Chloe and the team in, in lots of different ways. And hopefully, you know, check out the changemaker.berkeley.edu website. See if there's a, because there are electives in there. You might say, ah, I'm kind of a little bit further along in my studies than, than that front end class. It's like, well, there's, there's some neat, neat electives in there. Okay. Thanks, everybody.